Uh, and welcome everybody. Thanks for taking some time out of your afternoon to join us and talk about some question statistics. Uh, I'm going to go through a few different things today. Uh, I'll take you through an overview of uh, just the basics of statistics, types of stats, uh, what, what the statistics mean. We'll look at our uh, item analysis report and uh, give you a quick glance at how to, insert, how to interpret it. And then I'll go through examples of different types of questions um, with different types of statistics, whether it's um, maybe stats that lean you towards it maybe being a, a question that has an issue or um, some stats that maybe say, hey, this is a great question and, and we'll talk about what the differences between all those are. And then I'll give you some very, very general statistical guidelines to use with interpreting questions. Uh, whenever I talk about uh, psychometrics and item analysis, one of the things I like to say after the top is there's a lot of people who have a lot of views on how to do this. And uh, I think if you threw a rope around 100 psychometricians, you would probably get somewhere in the neighborhood of 94 different opinions. The reality of it is I, I really think most of it is the same. And then there's some slight variances here and there. And so I preface by saying this is my version. This is the way I like to interpret statistics. Uh, I'll try and give it to you as uh, unedited as possible. But here's what the stats are. Here's what they mean. And then I'm going to walk you through my process of applying those to an exam um, for purposes of scoring and things like that. So um, there, there are a lot of ways to do this. There are some very complex formulas and other statistics out there that we may not necessarily get into today. Um, but you know, I'm going to take you through something that I feel like is very applicable um, and a, an easy starting point for, hey, I have a bunch of statistics about a test. What should I do with them? What should my steps be? And that, that's going to be the goal. So, you know, where do you start? A lot of people ask questions like, is this a good or bad question? Or can statistics even tell me, is this a good or bad question? How do I reconcile what I know about my questions? I've used this question for years. My students have never had an issue with it. And all of a sudden, I'm seeing some weird statistics. How do I reconcile my assessments passed with what the data is telling me. And kind of to tie to what I was saying a moment ago about all the different opinions out there, that this, I don't think item analysis is a foolproof answer to these questions. I don't think that it can definitively tell you anything except for exactly how many people got it right, exactly how many people got it wrong, and what quartile those people fell into and things along those lines. But you do have to start somewhere with trying to answer these questions about your assessment. And these can be very, very useful pieces of that puzzle to put together along with the information about the content and the teaching method and different things like that that need to come into play as well when you're interpreting statistics about questions to really give you a true answer to questions like these as you look at your post-exam results. So to start, some different types of stats. Um, the most basic one, item difficulty and p-value. It is the decimal representation of um, the, let me restate that. There's a decimal representation of difficulty that, and that it, it's the percentage of the students who got the item correct. The lower the decimal, the higher the difficulty and vice versa. Um, it's very simply 80% of the class got it right or it, you might see it as 0.8, depending on the report you're looking at. Some of them actually represented as percentages, and some of them actually represented as decimals. But very, very, very simply, what percentage of the people who took this assessment got this answer correct? Now, the upper and lower 27% are just delving into that pool of your students a little bit. Your upper 27%, what percent of that top 27% got the question correct? So your highest performers on this assessment what percentage of them got this right versus your lower 27% performance? So we're basically just grouping it up. And I'm frequently asked uh, why 27%. Uh, and if you do some Googling, there's different reasons out there. But mainly, uh, the most accepted is that, one, it's industry standard. Two, um, you're trying to include as many people as possible to make those two groups significant without diluting them. And so some people um, will say to use the upper 25% um, and lower 25%. Um, we use, and, and most places use, the upper 27 and lower 27. Now, the discrimination index takes everything a little bit step further. You, it's the difference in performance between your upper and lower 27%. The discrimination index tells you, did this question discriminate between my best performers and my worst performers? Um, which is generally something you're looking to have a question do. Not always, mastery level questions and things like that that we'll get into here in a moment. But you're, you're looking for the, your question statistics to tell you whether or not this was a good differentiator of so the people who really knew the material and the people who didn't. 
Um, and the, the first way to look at that, and one of the easiest way to look at that, is the discrimination index, which basically just takes the percent of the upper 27% and subtracts the percent of the lower 27% to give you a number. The higher that number, the more discriminating it is. The lower that number, the less discriminating your question is. Now, the point by serial is kind of even takes discrimination a little bit further and incorporates more than just um, that particular question. Your point by serial is a way of looking at did doing well on this question represent doing well overall on the assessment? So is this item a good or bad predictor of overall performance on the exam? Does the, is this question representative of knowing overall the content that was represented within this exam? Um, sometimes you'll find that that is the case, sometimes you'll find it's not the case, and we'll go through some different ranges and, and what to expect when you see different ones. But the, the simplest way, and I'm trying to give the most basic interpretation of all of these tasks, but the simplest way is to say, does this question mean doing well overall? And it takes, it, it just, it measures discrimination, but it includes all of your students rather than just the groups in the upper and lower 27%. So this is an example of what our item analysis report looks like. And so um, if you use us, you're familiar with that. Uh, if not, there are lots of different programs out there that provide item analysis. The stats will be the same, whether they're presented in this order it might be a little bit different, but this is what you're gonna see. And so as you walk through an item, you take a look at the difficulty, see what percentage of that class got it right, then next to that, you're gonna see the upper and lower 27%, so you can start to get a feel for the different groups of, of performers within the exam and how they did. You'll see your discrimination index and point by serial, as well as just a, an answer count, a numerical representation of the exact count of the number of students who chose each answer choice, 207, 5, 2, 1, et cetera. And then one of the things that we provide is a point by serial by item choice and a discrimination index by item choice. Um, as well as the upper and lower 27% by item choice. Not everybody necessarily needs to dig into all of these things uh, when you're first getting into analyzing your exams and deciding whether or not you wanna keep a question or throw it out or accept multiple answers when you're going through your scoring process and you're using your statistics for the scoring process. But they are a great way to start sort of delve further into a question and take a look at, you know, trying to understand what the exam takers were thinking and, you know, what happened, why, you know, where are these different groups when it comes to performance? Um, where are these, how is each individual answer choice affecting the overall performance of the item? Um, you'll see that uh, you can, as you break these things down, you can then, it becomes useful to take a look at things like, okay, my 100% of my upper, got this correct, but as I look at 90% of my lower, where did they end up? Did they all end up on one question? Were these students who were just guessing? So, you know, the portion that didn't get it correct is all over the place on all the answer choices. These are some of the things you can start to get into by looking at, um, looking at the breakdown by answer choice. Now, as you look at some of the specific numbers, discri discrimination indexes that I'll start with. If it has zero, then there's no discrimination. The, the poor performing students and the highest performing students are getting the answer correct at exactly the same rate. If there's a negative number there, then that means more of the bottom students got it right than the top students. Um, and the higher that negative number is, so if it's negative you know, 0.2, um, that's you know, slight negative discrimination versus negative one would mean all of the lower students got it correct and none of the upper students got it correct. Same thing for positive discrimination. So, um, you know, if, if you had 80% of your top students get it and say 60% of your bottom students, you'd end up with 0.2. So there's some discrimination there. Uh, and the greater the distance between those groups, um, the higher that number is going to be. One being perfect discrimination, 100% of your upper students versus 0% of your lower. Now, at the end of this, I'll get into some guidelines as to what's a good and what's a bad discrimination index and point by zero. And, I, and I'm gonna use the terms good and bad very, very loosely because one of the things that as we go through some example questions here in a moment that I'm gonna show is, I don't think that there are any hard and set rules that are accurate. I don't believe that you can flat out say a point two discrimination index is good because I think that's where it's not. I also think that just 
just the same. You can have no discrimination index, and there are situations where that's actually okay. So I will give you some, some general, general, general guidelines, but again, I like to stay away from hard and fast rules because I don't think it's the most accurate way to interpret items. So let's look at some con the context, and let's look at the context um, with these examples. So this example right here is a mastery level question. Uh, you're going to see the discrimination index of 0 0.04, a point by serial of 0.1. Both of those numbers would be considered very low, not a very good indicator of overall performance on the exam, and an indicator of virtually no discrimination. But if your intention with the item is that it is a mastery level item, then that's okay. Um, you don't need to worry about it. Now, if this is something that was maybe supposed to be a discriminating item, you thought this was going to be something that really um, caused people to think and was going to be difficult for some of your students, and these are the numbers that come out, well, then you need to take a look at a couple of things because, you know, that, that doesn't really match up. Maybe you taught it better than you thought, or maybe the students have a copy of your exam somewhere and you weren't aware of it. Um, so, you know, it really depends on the intention of the item, and so I don't think you can disassociate the statistics from the actual item themselves. And so in looking at this one, and, you know, as long as your intention is for this to be a mastery level item, you've pretty much accomplished what you're looking for. Uh, and despite there being a low discrimination index and a low point by serial, the item might be fine to keep as part of your exam score. Now this next item uh, is a more of a discrimination question. You take a look and you see, okay, this difficulty index, p-value of 0.66, 66% 66 of the class got this right. That's not a huge number, but it's not super low. It's, it's, it's okay. But if you're going to have an item where a third of the class is missing it, you want to make sure it's the right third. So the next things we would take to look at here with the item would be, uh, what is the discrimination index and what is the point by zero? And when we take a look, they're looking really solid. You've got a 0.36 discrimination index, um, you know, the difference between 82% of the top of your class getting it and only 46% of the bottom of the class getting it. Uh, when you take a look at that distribution of your upper and lower 27 across those items, you'll see that the students who missed it are really well spread out amongst your distractors. So you've probably got pretty good distractors on this item. And the top students who missed it, they all weren't necessarily central on one particular item or answer choice that they thought it was, which can sometimes mean that there was a second correct answer. And this, a couple of them chose C, a couple of them chose E. So in general, you've got a nice item here that discriminates well between your top performing students and your lower performing students. And your, all of your answer choices are to at least a degree distracting um, and they're being used within the question. So overall, you, I would say that this is a very good discriminating question. Now, this next example, um, slight variance on the previous one. You take a look here, we've only got a p-value of 0.36. Only 36% of the class got it right. Now, if you look at the discrimination index in the point by serial, you would see 0.25 for the discrimination index and 0.22 for, for the point by serial. Those things indicate that there is discrimination happening, and 0.22 does indicate that there is a positive correlation between doing well on this item and doing overall well on the exam. But because of that 36% correct, um, you know, those, that discrimination index and that point by serial if you were going by a hard and fast rule that, you know, I've heard very frequently over the years as I've worked with different institutions that, you know, 0.2 for discrimination index and 0.2 by point by serial are good and anything above that is good, you know, I, I would disagree. And I would say that there's probably an issue here because as we dig into the question, while yes, there is a 0.25 difference between the upper and lower 27%, when you get into it, only 52% of your highest performing students actually got this question correct and 27% of your lowest performing students. Now the 27% number doesn't bother me so much, but the 52%, almost half of your highest scorers didn't get the question correct, that indicates to me that there's probably an issue. And if only 36% of the class overall is getting an item correct, I would like to see a discrimination index that's significantly higher and a point by serial that's significantly higher. I think, and this, and this comes into really having to get a little bit nuanced with the interpretation here. Take a look at the question. How was the question taught? Uh, you know, maybe it was a new person teaching this content this year, or did we try a new delivery method for the content? Um, is this a new question that's never been used before? There's a lot of things that you might, might want to start looking at when you see an item come out with these statistics. Um, and in general, if you look across here, what this, this item really shows is a lot of guessing. That 
your worst students really couldn't identify the correct answer at all and were guessing evenly between all of the answers, almost evenly. And your best students, they were able to narrow down a couple of them. They, you know, they were pretty sure it wasn't C, but we, we kind of got it down to B and D and then they, they did some guessing. And so this could be something where there's some additional information needed in the question, or maybe it's something where there was too much information and it confused them. But you need to sit down with the content expert who wrote this, or if you're the person who wrote this, you need to take a look at this and examine it, cross-reference it with the content used to teach this material and say, okay, you know, why did this come out this way? Because this is an item that, you know, if I were going through and scoring an exam, I would probably throw this item out, uh, or at the very least, if there was content reason to do so, I would maybe accept answer B. Uh, because of the percentage of people and the percentage of your top 27 that chose B, if there was anything that was maybe remotely correct about B. Um, so again, two different discriminating items, this one and the previous one, fairly similar discrimination in exploit by serial, but um, in one case that discrimination in exploit by serial is okay, and in, in the next case I would say it's probably not. Now this next item is a, a pretty classic example of reverse discrimination, and so uh, there can be lots of different reasons for that. Initially, you take a look at this and you see 55% of the class got it right. Okay, a little over half, that's not too bad, but as soon as you jump to the secondary statistics, it's very, very clear there's something wrong. Um, negative 0.57 discrimination index, negative 0 0.43, 0 0.4, 3, 0 0.50, meaning not only did this question not mean that people were, you know, doing bad, the people who got this right did better on the exam, but the people who got this right did worse on the exam. So um, that that's usually one of the biggest, clearest points um, that something is wrong, and it's actually kind of rare to see. You're not, you might see negative discrimination, you might see negative point by serial, but you're not going to usually see them this severe, but this makes it a really easy example. So as we take a look through, you see that, you know, 75% of the top students chose C, which is an incorrect answer, um, and only 25% of the top students chose B. This particular example is actually one from when I was at Ohio State, and, and I remember it. And one of the things that we found here was, that, and it became a very common trend with our students, some of our top students would overthink things. Um, or some of our top students would go above and beyond, and they would find some sort of way where, well, if this scenario happened and that circumstance was in play, and they found a way to, to a six degrees of Kevin Bacon sort of way to find a reason to choose a different correct answer. And that was never really the intention. And usually what happened is uh, when you saw something like this, only the absolute best students could really make the connection. And it wasn't a connection that was intended to be made, although it might be valid. So this could be an instance where you accept C and D, or this could be an instance where you have to throw it out completely. Um, and you know the, the numbers here are generated because your average student and your lower performing student, it was too advanced for them to make the connection. Now, sometimes it wasn't necessarily just about a connection. Sometimes it was about the way something was taught. And that's where, again, I say statistics have to be married with the rest of the picture. Um, and what we found was that occasionally we would assign a supplemental reading or a supplemental resource. And that as you, when you assign those things, it was usually your best students who would actually take the time to go do the things that weren't required. And so they went and read the supplemental reading that nobody else read, and so they got a kind of even deeper understanding of the topic than the rest of the students, and that led them to maybe uh, be led astray by one of the other answer choices. Um, so there can be a variety of reasons why an answer, uh, why statistics are the way they are. Um, you know, this could be a missed key where the, the answer is really C and it's just way too hard a concept, um, or it could be something with the content, or it could be something with extraneous information inside the question. The statistics will never tell you that, but they are going to tell you, hey, look, this is a red flag, take a look at me, I need to be fixed. Um, and, and then you can go from there in making your scoring decisions as you go through an exam. Now this next one is another one of those kind of borderline questions. Um, Difficulty of 0.52, a little over half the class getting it right. Um, but unlike the previous question where a little over half the class got it right, your discrimination index 0.22, point by serial of 0.18, uh, and about 64% of the top of the class got it right versus 42% of the lower. These are the, the sometimes the hardest ones, the biggest gray areas. About half the class, that usually will tell you something's wrong. Yeah, you had more of your upper students than your lower, and it wasn't just half your upper students missing it. You know, two-thirds about got it right, but there still could be something here. And in this case particularly, um, if you take a look at answer choice A, you'll see that a large percentage of both the top and bottom students chose A, um, and almost everyone who didn't choose the correct answer out of your top group 
also chose A. So it, it could tip you off very quickly that there might be some validity to A, or your students think there's some validity to A, um, and based on maybe incomplete understanding, or the question was a little too difficult for them, et cetera. So um, again, every question a little bit different, a little bit more nuanced, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a matter of a lot of different factors coming together as you interpret these things. Um, but the, the starting point is always the same when you get to an item. You're always going to start with what percentage got it right, and usually the next thing you'll move on to is discrimination and point by serial. Only once you get into some more complicated scenarios or you see some bad numbers, do you really need to dig through the discrimination index per answer choice or the upper and lower 27% per answer choice. But it is very handy to have them there because they can start to lead you to not just you know what happened, because the item statistics in general tell you that, but maybe start to point you in the direction of why it happened. This last one is, a, is another example of a really good discriminating question. Um, and you've got 90% of your upper 27% getting it, 56% of your lower 27 for a very solid discrimination index, very solid point by serial, 71% uh, of the class overall got it correct. Um, you know, the one thing I would point out here and something that we um, worked with our faculty a little bit on is if you consistently have questions where certain answer choices are never being used, um, it might you might want to try swapping out that answer choice. Either in this case, just drop it to a four answer choice question, um, or swap something else in that maybe is a little bit more plausible than what the current answer choice for A would be, um, because you want plausible distractors that um, that are going to, you know, maybe trip somebody up. You're not, and your intention is never to trip people up when you write a question. It's purely to, uh, you know, assess knowledge and assess their understanding. Um, but at the same time, if, if it's never being used, you might want to change up those distractors. Um, the exception to that, again, obviously, is a mastery level question. The, you know, if your intention is every single person really does need to know this. It's a very basic fundamental thing, but it's important enough that even though it's basic and fundamental, I need to test it, then you're going to see, you know, everybody ending up on one answer choice and answer choices that no one else is choosing, and that, that's fine. Now, some general guidelines. And again, as I hope you saw with, with the different examples I gave, um, it, there is not a specific number I'm particularly comfortable with when it comes to any of these specific stats. Um, for item difficulty and p-value, the acceptable item difficulty is not a set number. It's a correlation with your question intention. You as a faculty member have to decide, is this a mastery level item? Is this supposed to be a discrimination question? Um, or, you know, or is this maybe, maybe it's not going to be the hardest discrimination question in the world, but it's not super easy that everyone's going to get it. You have to have at least a gut feel for what your intention is behind your assessment because that'll help you when you look at it. If you intended a mastery question and in you, it comes out with uh, one is the, the p-value or 0.96 or 0.94, great, no problem. I mean, it's intended discriminating question that, you know, you're not going to like to see a, a one, one p-value on a discriminating question and vice versa. And sometimes, like I was saying in the examples, that can tell you something. Now, for the upper 27%, I would say that there's a little bit more firm of a guideline here. If less than 60% of your top performers are getting a question correct, and why 60? That's just that's my comfortable level, and and every you know I feel like everyone has to kind of choose theirs, but I think it's a fair one to say about 60% of your top performers, if less than that are getting it correct, you really need to take a look at if there's an issue with the question. Again, maybe it's multiple correct answers, confusing wording too much extraneous info, too little extraneous info. Uh, maybe it has to do with how the content was taught or how this information was provided to students. Um, the other thing would be that if less of your upper 27 get it correct and your lower 27, also another big red flag, you need to take a look at an issue. So, um, you know, not as necessarily a number you're going to go look for in every question. It's going to be how they relate to the other statistics within a question. Uh, but this is a guideline. And and I would say too that the one ex there's exceptions to everything, um, and that's what makes this difficult. And this is what frustrates faculty sometimes. Uh, in the past, when I've worked with different faculty, some of what they get frustrated by is they want it to be very clean cut and clear. As much as I sit here and say, if you have a negative discrimination uh, where you know less of your upper 27 get it than your lower, there could be an issue. Sometimes that's even not true. If it's a mastery question and you had, you know, 94% of your top students or 96% of your top students get it and 100% of your bottom students, it could just be that that random fact 
you know, slip the mind of a couple of your top students, and so the negative discrimination is meaningless. Or it could be that, you know, they clicked the wrong button, or they bubbled in the wrong circle on the sheet. There's a lot of different, you know, plausible scenarios for that. So even with some of the most obvious things, like negative discrimination, there's exceptions to that. Now your lower 27, again, generally, you never want it to be higher than your upper 27. And as low as zero can be acceptable on a very, very highly discriminating question. I would say even on discriminating questions, you, it's rare to see zero, but it can happen. Um, but as high as 100% of your bottom can be okay if it's mastered. So again, getting back to that intention. What is your intention for the question? Uh, you know, you've been teaching this for 20 years. You know what the difficult things are for students historically and what the, you know, things are usually pretty solid in are historically. Use that history and that guide and that experience you have in interpreting these statistics. Now for the discrimination index, um, some set specific numbers of acceptable and unacceptable values um, exist out there. I would say that one of the things, if you look up guides for interpreting item analysis, you will see various um, publications out there that will say anything 0.2 and above is good or anything 0.3 and above is good and so on. Again, I think we showed with the different scenarios where that is true in some cases and not so true in others. And so I think the most accurate guide is that the lower the p-value, so the lower number of the percentage of people who got the question right, the higher your discrimination index needs to be. If it's a very, very high p-value for a mastery question, um, you know, 100% of your top versus 96% of your bottom, well, that's, you know, okay. You're not going to get a very high or good discrimination index out of that. Um, but if it's 50% if it's of the class getting it right versus 20% of the class getting it right, well, you need to have considerably different discrimination numbers for those two things. And so it's, it's more of a, a, a relationship there. Now, if you're asking for at what point with discrimination do you see, is it safe to say that it is actual discrimination, that's where I would say point two, the item is considered to have discriminated. Um, less than that is really considered no discrimination or very little discrimination. And point three or greater is generally considered highly discriminated. Um, and so that's, you know, if you see 0.09, just because there's that little amount of discrimination there doesn't necessarily mean that you actually truly discriminating between the students because there's just too much variance in performance. Um, so in, in the sense of when does it actually become a significant number, I, the, there's generally accepted out there that 0.2 and 0.3 range is considered, yes, it discriminates, and, and once you start getting higher, the, it's considered highly discriminating. But again, just because it highly discriminated in your group of students doesn't mean that the question was still appropriate for your exam or for your content. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily mean it's appropriate to keep it as part of the scoring. Point by serial, very similar. Um, there are some set numbers of acceptable and unacceptable. Um, point two is considered to have discrimination and positive association with overall performance. Lower levels are acceptable for mastery, you know, just like discrimination index. And point three and higher would, would be something that you really want to for higher discriminating items. Again, it's a, it's a relationship there between how many students are getting it correct and what you're looking for your point by serial to be. Um, it, discrimination index and point by serial are very similar in that way. Now, the last one I'm going to talk about is the KR20, um, and I save it for last for a couple of reasons. Uh, it's not really an item statistic, it's an overall assessment statistic. Um, it's used as a measure of the reliability of the assessment, and it's measuring variance. It's basically um, measuring whether the variance experienced in the scores in the, of the students on your exam is due to random variance or due to perhaps an issue with the actual assessment tool itself. Now the math and everything behind the KR20 is really, really advanced and difficult to understand, so I'm not going to get very far into it. It's measured on a scale of 0 to 1, with 0 being very poor and 1 being excellent. Now, if, you, if you're familiar with us, uh, we at the top of our uh, summary report for faculty members, we do put a KR20 on there and it has a little scale and it'll, it even shows you very poor to excellent going red to green. Um, one of the frequent things we hear um, is people very concerned that they see bad numbers on the KR20. And then the other things we sometimes see is, is assessments that maybe do have some issues, but that still receive a high KR20. A couple of things and notes on this that I really want to make sure to get out there. Um, the KR20 is heavily, heavily influenced by the number of questions in the assessment 
and the number of students taking the assessment. And as a result of that, you can have extreme false positives and extreme false negatives. So, you know, we, our account managers frequently get calls and I'll jump on the line with a, a client of ours and we'll be discussing their, their statistics and they're asking for help because, hey, you know, no matter how many times I give this assessment and what tweets I make to it, um, I can't seem to get a really good care 20. And then they're telling me about it and it's a 10 question quiz given to 25 students. Well, with, with numbers that low, you're just gonna, it's not accurate. It's not a good statistic for those things and it should, in my opinion, be flat out ignored when you get to very, very low numbers like that. So now if you have 125 questions and 150 or 200 or 300 students, then it's something that you can put some more weight into. Um, but again, it's still just pointing you to a red flag. It's very difficult to look at a KR20 and say, okay, I have a bad KR20 um, and ha expect the KR20 to tell you why there's a problem. It's not going to do that. It's just going to tell you there's a problem and then you need to go delve into the other item statistics to start to figure out where your problem may lie. So um, just a couple of thoughts on the KR20, not something I want to go super in depth in, um, but there are some very, very common mistakes when interpreting it. Um, and, and that's with the pulse, false positives, false negatives from the low number of students and the low number um, of questions within the assessment. So there's a lot of scenarios where it should be basically ignored. Now, there's some extraneous factors, and I've started to talk about these a little bit. Um, and part of why I opened with stats alone don't tell the whole story. Student behavior is a major part of item statistics. If students are cheating, it's going to mess up your item statistics a lot. You're going to see stats that don't make sense. You'll see a discriminating item that for 10 years you've used it and had a discrimination index of 0.4 and a point by serial of 0.3, and yet all of a sudden this year 100% of the class got it right. Well, that stat is, is still pointing you to something, but it's pointing you to the fact that, hey, maybe this question got out there. Uh, maybe somebody from last year's class memorized it, wrote it down, and you know, gave it to their frat brothers or something. Um, you know, so cheating can definitely mess with your item statistics, and cheating can sometimes be detected um, by your item statistics. The other thing with um, student behavior is there's something I like to call the student return on investment. And this was a scenario that happened um, very blatantly with us when I was at the Ohio State College of Medicine. And as we went through some curricular reform, one of the things we did was we integrated different parts of our curriculum that previously weren't integrated. And as part of that, something that used to be kind of its own standalone unit for a few weeks that had a hundred question tests and that was it, got spread out over two years. And it ended up being maybe four or five questions worth of content on every 120 question block exam. So it's a very small percentage of the exam. And as we integrated it, one of the things we did is we decided that it was content that could be learned with independent study, that it didn't necessarily need in-class curricular time. And so the content was learned through maybe a 20 or 30 page journal article that they had to read or uh, you know long e-learning modules that were itself paced and so on and what our students decided was I'm not going to take the six eight hours it takes to read this and reread this and study it and master it when it's only three or four questions on the exam and so they kind of collectively or they all independently decided the same thing decided, you know, we're just going to blow these off. I'm going to take that eight hours. I'm going to go study the core content an extra eight hours. And even if I end up guessing wrong and missing the two or three questions about this content, I'm more than making up those two or three points um, by studying these things that will be tested more frequently on the exam. And so one of the things that we had to do was make the decision that even when the statistics came out horribly and they, they were reverse discrimination and 18% or 12% of the class got it right, that we were going to keep those questions as part of our scoring, as part of our assessment. Um, otherwise, every single exam they would be thrown out and by the end of the curriculum, all of the questions on that content area would have been thrown out and they would have never been tested over it, at least not in any way that counted. So now it's hard to do that when uh, you're looking at stats that bad. It's it's real hard, you know, uh, even despite knowing what was going on, we were still a little gun-shy to do it at first. Part of what helped us be confident enough to make the decision, though, to say, hey, these questions are okay despite these statistics was we had a very good quality review program. Uh, so another plug for our upcoming webinar that, you know, 
quality review programs for items and having peer review and putting a system in place that really works is very important, not just for having quality items, but for helping you make better and more informed scoring decisions, helping you eliminate variables when it comes to looking at item statistics and say, okay, what's wrong with this? If you've had it peer reviewed by four other content experts in your curriculum and you know it's appropriate difficulty and everything else, it's a lot easier to say, all right, I know it's not X problem, let's look at Y problem. And so we, because we had a good quality review team, we were able to say, all right, we're gonna keep these questions in. We're safe feeling that they're appropriate as far as difficulty and wording and there's nothing wrong with them. So the students in that case were really throwing off our statistics for us. Now occasionally in team talk courses or uh, especially in health professions where everything isn't black and white, you know, medicine is full of gray areas, um, you're gonna have conflicting content and faculty. And so despite the fact that maybe the question is, well written, um, and despite the fact that you, you know it has a clear, acceptable answer, maybe somebody else feels a little bit differently, or maybe it's a, a difficult area that you know has some overlap with something someone else taught, and the students are getting confused between what Professor A and Professor B said. Um, so make sure that you know you don't have conflicting content and, and conflicting faculty members. And then the six degree from Sunday example that I gave earlier. Sometimes your best students, despite all your intentions, are gonna find some crazy way to connect things that you never imagined when you reviewed the item that they were gonna connect. And it seemed to you that there was one clear answer, but, and, and you have some statistical problems with it, you take a look at it and you see, oh, you know what, and my students make connections that I never intended for them to make and that's why I'm having these stats. So um, the stats don't necessarily mean that things are a good or a bad question. Um, the stats are influenced by so many external factors. So um, ways to increase the accuracy and usefulness of your stats, like I was saying, an item review process, review the format of the items, review the level of difficulty, make sure it's appropriate for the um, skill level and the, the progress of the students that are being tested. Make sure your alternate correct options are accurate, they're not distracting, um, they're not, or they're not distracting in a negative way, meaning that, you know, um, multiple are correct because of conflicting content, conflicting faculty. Um, you know, we even see things sometimes where there's a correct answer that's three sentences long and incorrect answers that are all two words each. Um, so things like that in, in an item review process will catch and those things can affect your stats as well. The other way to increase the accuracy and usefulness of your stats is for his, using historical item analysis. Sometimes one year of, of stats is just not enough. And so um, take a look at this question's performance on multiple assessments, multiple versions. If you've made edits to the question, look at the first version, look at the second version and compare the statistics. And then reuse, recycle. As you're using these over year over year over year, watch and see, okay, every year I give this question for five years, it comes out at about 70% of the class getting it right. Um, now you can have some security in those and you can say, all right, these are, this is a consistently performing item so that when something out of the blue happens, you know whether it's out of the blue or whether it's it's uh, you know maybe something that uh, is wrong with the item. If an item is performed fine for five years and all of a sudden goes wrong, you're going to look at external factors and you're going to look less at the actual question itself. Um, so reusing and recycling helps you build up to a significant number um, of students who have taken that question so that your statistics about the question are more and more meaningful. So where do we fit in? Obviously, we have a lot of different, um, you know, reports for these things. If you're using our system, we've got simplified versions, detailed versions of item analysis reports. Um, we log that historical item analysis I was just talking about for you by version, by assessment it was used on, and in aggregate across all those things. So um, our, our data bank is constantly kind of learning and updating itself from every single time somebody takes an assessment. You're going to be able to take a look at how the item performed on that assessment, how the item performed across assessments. Um, if you do versions of questions where you make some edits and now you have a new version, our software automatically separates those stats for you and shows you the version one and version two stats. And it'll also show you across both versions as well. So um, we give you a lot of ways to look at it, a lot of places to look at it. We try and gather as much information to give you as many puzzle pieces as possible. 
And so uh, if you're not getting the information you need, if you, if you went through this today and said, hey, you know, part of my problem with interpreting the stats is I'm not getting half these stats. Um, I need more statistics than just the percent correct. Um, then this is definitely an area where we could help you out because um, we provide a lot of different statistics. The other thing um, that we allow you to do is pull that, those item statistics by different things. So you, if you have a multidiscipline exam and let's say you've got anatomy, pathology, and pharmacology and different things represented, we allow you to pull, let me have the item analysis for all the questions that belong to a certain category. Um, or if you have team talk courses with multiple authors, show me all of the questions for the item analysis for the questions written by Dr. Jones, and let me pull a report of all the questions written by Dr. Smith, et cetera, um, and that way you can kind of narrow down to what's important to you or the areas you're responsible for and things like that. So we give you a lot of different filters and ability to take a look at these things. So with that, I'm gonna pass it back to Jason for just a moment so he can tell you a little bit more about our upcoming webinar. Jason, are you with us? All right, I will tell you about our upcoming webinar. So, um, like I was saying before, we have an upcoming webinar. Um, the If you go to our learn.examsoft.com slash resources page, um, you can get information about that webinar. Um, there is an abstract posted there, and uh, you'll be able to register for it, and you'll get email reminders. Um, it is a really, really great webinar about applying the peer review process to the development of assessments. And, um, you know, there's lots of places that have tried this, and there's lots of ways to do it that are a burden to faculty, and there are um, ways to do it that make it very, very effective for your curriculum for your faculty. So I really strongly encourage you to uh, test that out. And so hopefully while I've been talking about this webinar, you've been throwing some questions in the uh, chat window there. So if you haven't already done so, put some questions in there, and we'll get to those questions here just in a moment. Thank you so much, Eric. I, I appreciate you taking the time. Yes, everyone, do feel free to look at our other resources, uh, whether it be white papers, webinars, videos, et cetera. Um, a variety and, and wealth of information is available on the website. And, and we do have several questions, uh, so um, I'd like to go ahead and pose those. And Eric, if you'd like to answer, that'd be fabulous. First, um, what should faculty do in review of items? Should they do a first pass by looking at the stats and then look at the format of questions? Specifically, if a question has great stats but could be written better, should they worry about editing the question? So, um, in general, what we would do is we would go through and we would make a first pass at the stats. Um, and I would usually make a list of the questions that the stats um, concerned me or that I felt like needed um, some further investigation. And now, I'm not, I wasn't a faculty member, so I didn't actually teach. Um, my area of expertise was just assessment. So I would sit with the block leaders. Many of you sitting here today may actually be the people who both go through the stats and our faculty members. And so we did combine that process. It just took more of us. Some of you will be able to do this on your own. But first we went through, made a pass at the, um, the statistics, looked for anything that had even remote red flags, and then we would go through each of those more in depth one by one. Now, if a question had really good stats, uh, but still could be in a better format, um, that was less a process of our item review um, and after an exam and more of our process of item review before an exam. And so I, I do still believe um, specifically in um, degrees or, or programs where your students take a certification exam, um, I do believe in changing those items even if they have very good statistics. Um, now sometimes you can look at an item and, and there just really isn't um, you know, even though it's not the greatest format of question in the world or you, you'd like to get it out of that format, there's just not a better way to ask it. And sometimes that happens. Uh, most of the time, not though. And so what I would say is we generally didn't make scoring decisions after an exam based on purely format um, if the stats were great. We, um, we would, though, make those decisions as part of a review process, and so that, I think that other webinar would be helpful for that. And we would still try and get those into board format or um, things like that, uh, you know, nursing, med, farm, dental, all of them have boards, and they all have very specific formats that questions appear. So, um, you know, we would do that occasionally. It's just not doable, but that would be something we did. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, do you have examples of how a program of study uh, or an entire course, not just individual faculty, have utilized exam statistics for making change? Uh, yeah, um, and I think 
I think there's some on our website um, in our resources section. There's some things done by myself when I was at Ohio State and other areas where programs have kind of taken a look at this information on a more macro level. Um, not, you know, an individual question doesn't necessarily give you input about your curriculum to say, you know, students are good or bad at a certain subject area or certain learning outcome, et cetera. But the category data does. Um, and being able to pull performance by category or take a look at, you know, maybe there was 20 questions on an exam that pertain to a certain subject area. Um, programs would do some of that filtering I was talking about where they would filter it to a certain content area and then look at the item statistics for every question in that content area rather than worrying about an individual one and say, okay, across all the questions and statistics we see for this content area, is there a trend of poor performance or good performance, et cetera, and then using that information to target their change. A lot of times we see sweeping reforms in school. Let's overhaul our curriculum. Let's, you know, uh, start from scratch. Let's go from integrated to not integrated or integrated or not integrated to integrated rather. Or let's move the competency base and you make these wholesale sweeping changes. And a lot of times they're necessary. But in, in some cases, you know, especially within a certain block or a certain lecture or a certain course, wholesale changes are sometimes made to fix an issue overall that you don't necessarily need wholesale changes to fix. You can use the item statistics, use category statistics to more targetedly identify, you know, hey, it's these three learning outcomes that the students are really struggling with. Not all 10 learning outcomes in my course or not all 20 learning outcomes on my four lectures in, in this block, but it's these three learning outcomes. So I'm gonna take a couple days away from this topic and add those in and spend some more time over here. Maybe I'll go get an expert to do a review session for me on this. Maybe we'll provide some supplemental materials, but it gives you a more targeted approach using these things at a macro level, whether that's taking a look at item statistics by group or whether that's looking at category data or competency data, et cetera. Thank you, Eric. Next question is, how would you use these statistics for a student evaluation? Um, are, are, I guess I would clarify there. Are you saying these, these type of statistics when it's the student maybe evaluating the professor instead of answering questions? Um, or, are you, or would it be in the scenario of sitting down with the student to go over their performance? Um, you know, I don't know that in the scenario of, you know, students answering questions about a faculty member that all these stats work exactly the same way. I, I'm, and in fact, I would think some of them would be quite different. Um, as far as using these in a scenario with sitting down with the students to work on their performance, um, the only way I think it's applicable is to say, hey, you know, you're consistently missing all of the ones that are discriminating. So the, the, the higher level concepts or the application level concepts, you're struggling with those, let's go through them. Or, hey, you know, you, you come in here and you, you know, rail about the test, but in reality, you know, 85% of your classmates got these 10 questions that you're complaining about right, we need to take a look at how you're studying or your understanding of these concepts and things like that. So, um, you know, there's some applicability there for an individual student, um, but not as much as obviously for assessing the assessment itself. So the clarification is uh, using this information when a student evaluates a professor. Gotcha. Um, you know, I I hate to pass the buck, but I, I, I haven't used these statistics for those purposes very often, so I don't want to pass myself off as an expert on that when I'm not. Um, but I would say that, um, you know, there are reasons to look at these stats in, in the context of the student's performance in the course. Um, I've seen instances over the years and studies over the years where if you were to look at, you know, um, the people who gave fives versus the people who gave ones, and you see that, oh, all the people who gave ones got C's and D's in the class um, versus all the people who gave fives got A's in the class um, versus if you were to look at it and say, oh, you know, there's really not a solid correlation between their grade and what they're rating me, then you can use the stats a little bit more accurately. But there's a lot of factors that can come into play with using these stats in an evaluation sense um, that aren't the same as using it to, um, you know, assess student knowledge. So it, it would be very different to use these stats for that, but I, I wish I could give you better pointers on how to do that. It's just not something I'm, I'm very much an expert in. And I'll add a short perspective from my end. I'm former faculty and uh, division chair administration for some colleges in the United States. And I'll say that 
the mechanisms used for the the mechanisms employed for the evaluation of student performance around um, an item like a, you know direct assessment, whether it be through a test or an assignment, are typically not used to evaluate faculty performance. There are other mechanisms employed by the institution uh, to look at that. Certainly, I think you could use this information for a more holistic approach um, if you want to look at the grander picture. But typically, the faculty eva faculty evaluation uh, is not driven by student performance. That seems a little bit, um, it's not anything that I've ever done when I evaluated my faculty uh, when I was still teaching in, in administration. Um, the next question uh, that we have is, um, how would you distinguish among the following for a poorly performing set of questions? Uh, the first option, questions were poorly written, two, uh, teaching method was ineffective, and three, the exam was in incorrectly blueprinted. Um, you know, it, that's a little tough. Um, you, you're going to have to bring a lot of different um, outside factors into play there. So, you know, you're going to take a look at the item statistics. You see the item statistics are bad, and you're trying to figure out which of those it is. Um, your historical data is going to become very important there. If you've given the question five years in a row and it always performed well and you have a new method of delivering that content this year, maybe you took a lecture and turned it into an e-module or something, then that's going to tip you off to, okay, you know, the question has been the same. The question has shown us a history of positive performance. So that helps you sort of rule out that it's actually a poorly written question and points you more towards uh, either the blueprinting aspect or the delivery aspect. Then you've got to take a look and say, you know, was this content supposed to be on the exam? Were the students aware they were going to be tested about this? Um, is this a learning outcome that they didn't think would be present? Uh, was this not something that was focused on? Okay, it was focused on. It was a learning outcome that they thought it would be present. Now we need to look at the delivery method because we've seen, we know this is a well-written item from past performance. Uh, we know, so we know that that's not the issue. We know that the the outcome that this test was supposed to be a part of this assessment. So now we need to go look at that delivery method. Did the students not like it? Was it confusing? Or did, you know, like in my instance, it just took too long, so they chose not to do it. Um, sometimes we would even bring in things like um, the evaluation of lectures or the evaluation of lecturers and see if we saw a trend about, you know, a certain lecture being very, very confusing and students having a lot of complaints and issues with it um, and match that up with the questions about that lecture to say, oh, okay, well, you know, the evaluation comments we're seeing match up with the statistics here that this was bad and, well, they're telling us why, those sorts of things. Um, you know, if you look and you say you don't have a historical um, your stats to look at and you didn't really change the method, then some, some post-exam peer review might be in order. Take it to some other people who, you know, are familiar with your content and who are familiar with the way they should be, the students should be assessed, the formatting of questions and say, hey, you know, look at this. Let me know if you think there's some sort of issues and, you know, if the peer review comes back fine, um, you know, then again, that can point you towards um, some of the other things. Okay, you know, the peer review on this question came back fine, but then I, you, you know, you look at it and you say this wasn't something the students were expected to be assessed over, uh, you know, or, or things along those lines. So it is difficult. Um, you know, those are probably the, the combination of those three things as the options for what's wrong is probably the hardest deciphering to do. Um, but if you've got enough pieces of information available to you, specifically outside the stats, um, it is doable to figure out. Thank you so much, Eric. One final question is, uh, what would you consider to be a good KR20 score? Uh, I would say probably 0.7, 0 0.8 um, and above. Um, uh, you know, again, it was something I, in my time in academia, didn't use very much because frequently, you know, our sample sizes were just too small. Um, so it wasn't necessarily the most reliable stat for us. Um, and even if I saw a very good KR20, um, I would still pour through the stats on every single question. Um, I, I don't, some people, you know, look at the stats of each question. If the overall um, KR20 gives them an indicator that there might be something wrong with the exam, we look through every question anyway. So uh, for us, it wasn't really something we use very often. But um, the most widely accepted would be somewhere 0 0.7, 0 0.8 and above um, would be considered a good KR20. Excellent. Thank you so much, Eric, for your time today. I appreciate you sharing your expertise with all of us today, with, with all of us.
No problem. So everyone, thank you so much for attending the webinar today. We appreciate you taking the time to learn more about psychometrics. This is a reminder that within the next few days, all attendees and registrants will receive a follow-up email with a link to a recording. Uh, the link, uh, the email message that contains the link to the recording will also include uh, links to resources including the presentation deck and the certificate of completion uh, for having attended this session. Again, if you do uh, are so inclined, please feel free to share the recording uh, with your colleagues as you see fit. And uh, also, uh, at the conclusion of this webinar, you will receive an opportunity to participate in the short six-question survey. This helps us uh, refine the webinar process and continue to provide relevant content in any future presentation. So thank you everyone for your time today. Uh, if you do have any questions, if we weren't able to answer your question, if you'll uh, advance to the next slide, Eric, um, do feel free to uh, contact us uh, for any further information and uh, we're happy to be of assistance. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful afternoon.